Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Flipped History. Our topic today is immigration to the United States. Our essential question for today, what are some of the greatest challenges and rewards for immigrants coming to the United States? We're going to talk specifically about the challenges that they face today. In our learning outcome, you should be able to identify the factors that pushed and pulled immigrants to the United States, distinguish between old and new immigrants, and number three, describe the treatment of immigrants at the processing stations. Now, take a look at this chart here. It's a little hard to see, but on the left-hand side, this is approximately 1880. We're going, still going to see a large number of Northwestern Europeans that are going to be coming to the United States, almost 50%. And then the other 50% are going to be split between uh, Eastern and Southern Europe and the rest of the world. And when we're talking the rest of the world, we're th really thinking Japanese and Chinese. Now, fast forward to 1910, we are going to see an exponential rise in Eastern and Southern Europeans. They are now going to be the predominant ones, almost three quarters coming to the United States, while Northwestern Europeans are going to dip all the way down to 16%. So the push and pull factors. What a push factor is is something that is going to push the immigrant out of their home country. It could be an economic problem, maybe they lost their job or they have no money. It could be overpopulation, which would lead to not having a job. It could be a famine, it could be disease, it could be political unrest, or they could be persecuted in the, in the sense of the Russian Jews where they're facing these pogroms and almost religious extermination. A pull factor would be something that the United States is offering that they do not have at home. And really the number one thing is jobs. Uh, the United States is going to have a boom in industrialization, and there's going to be a lot, a lot, a lot of jobs available for people. The standard of living also is going to be much higher than what they're going to have in their home country. They could also come here for religious freedom. Maybe because they're Catholic, they can come to the United States and practice their religion freely. Also, they're going to see a lot of advertisements in newspapers. Businesses in the United States are going to advertise of how great their business is and how much money that their workers are going to be making to entice these immigrants to come to the United States. Also, family members are going to be sending letters back home trying to tell, their, tell the rest of their family that the United States is such a great place. I mean, something along the lines of the streets are paved with gold. This place is the most great place ever. Now, old immigrants, first wave, we're talking 1700, so we're even talking pre-revolution here through the mid-19th century. Really, we're, it's starting to tail off by 1850, and it really goes until 1880, like that first chart that you saw. These immigrants are looking for a new life. They're families, they're Protestant, they have a little bit of money, and they're educated, and mainly from North and Northwest Europe, Britain, Netherlands, and the Germanys at this point. And they're going to establish small towns and individual farms. Again, they're somewhat educated. They have an idea about what they want to do and what they want to establish here in the United States. Now, the intermediate wave. We're going to overlap just a little bit between the 1830s and 1870s. And the intermediate wave, we're specifically talking about the Irish. They are escaping their potato famine and religious persecution, again, for being Catholic. They are poor, they have a limited education, and the two major areas that they're going to be working is the Erie Canal and textile mills. They're going to get a little bit of work on the Transcontinental Railroad, but the canal and the textile mills are the two main industries, uh, specifically New York City and Boston. And these are the guys doing the heavy lifting. These are the day laborers here. Now, new immigrants, the second wave as they're known. We're talking mid-19th century, again, a little bit of overlap, dating back to 1850, 1860, to 1914. And there's a specific reason why we cut it off at 1914. These people are escaping poverty, famine, and persecution. They are mostly single, and if they did come single, they usually had a plan to return home uh, much later after they had made a lot of money in the United States, so they can go home and live like kings. If they did plan to stay, they would take part in what was called chain migration, where they would send for family members one at a time, whether that was their wife, their aunt, uncle, children, whatever that it was. These people predominantly came from Italy, from Poland, and from Russia. Now, these are very distinctly different looking people than those from North and Northwest Europe. This is where a lot of the discrimination is going to come in. Mainly, not just for the way they look, but their religious beliefs as well. We have Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Jewish people that are coming here. The Protestants are really going to have major issues with these new immigrants coming in. And they're poor and had a very limited education. These are the guys that are going to be living in the city and working in the city. The first wave of immigrants are now starting to move outside of the city, whereas these people are going to live in very highly concentrated areas known as ethnic enclaves. Things like Koreatown, Little Italy, and uh, that kind of thing. Now, the voyage. What does it take to get from Europe to the United States? If you are first or second class citizen, meaning you had 
money to buy the best ticket or kind of the intermediate ticket. It was an 8 to 14 day journey depending on the steamship line. You were guaranteed successful immigration to the United States or the steamship company would send you home for free. They had better everything, better food, better cabin, better bathroom. They had access to the deck. Okay, If you were in the third class, you did not have these things. And not to mention, probably the greatest advantage of them all, immigration met you on the ship. You did not have to go to a processing station to get entry into the United States. Now, take a look at this picture here. This reminds me of the movie Titanic, of the kind of the grand ballroom, where you'd go and you'd kind of intermingle with all the other upper class, high class people. The third class did not have access to this at all. Now, the steerage class, also known as the third class, they did not have good food at all. They really only had a thin soup. And they had a shared cabin. And the shared cabin was not just with five or six other people. It was in the hundreds. It was like a, a huge bunk area. And they had a shared bathroom. And bathroom in quotes there because it really wasn't even a bathroom. It was more like a hole in the floor or a bucket in the room. And they did not have any deck access. They probably didn't even have a window on most of these cruise ships. So you know what happens when you get a bunch of people into a room. It gets really hot and humid and sticky. And these people are the last to leave. There was no intermingling between first and second wave with the third wave. The first and second class would see these people as kind of the scum and have a conversation with them. Again, go back to the movie Titanic. These are the guys that get locked down below deck as the ship is sinking. They have no help at immigration. They have no access to the immigration agents on the ship. They have to take a smaller ship to go to the immigration processing station at Ellis Island. And... Being that it was such a close quarters, and disease is going to be rampant here in this third class because of this open bathroom area where they're eating. Pox, tuberculosis, and the flu are pretty significant here. And if you were deemed unable to work or if you had a contagious disease, you would not be allowed entry into the United States. Here's a drawing of kind of what the steerage class looks like. You can see bunk beds there on the top left, and it's more of a picnic table type eatery. There's no kind of three, four, five course meals here down in the third class. Here's another picture. You can see again another kind of picnic table area and the bunks in the back there. Again, they're all shared. And you can see this one actually does have a, a small window there on the left. Now, once they are ready to disembark the ship, they would leave again last. They would not be leaving before the first or second wave. And they would have to take a smaller ship to Ellis Island. From there, they would be on their journey of a between three to five hours to see if they would get entry into the United States. And while they were disembarking the ship, they would only bring what they could. What you see with these people here is probably everything that they owned. Again, here's another picture of this guy. Probably everything that that family has is on in that sack on his shoulder. Now the processing station itself, there are two major ones that we'll talk about. Ellis Island processes approximately 70% of all immigrants between 1892 and 1954 when it closes. It's about a five-hour process. That was the long, uh, long end of the process. Generally, uh, for the most part, three, two to three or three to five hours, depending on the person. There's a physical exam, and if you had any sort of health problems, you would immediately be sent back to the steamship and be sent home. There'd be a set of 29 questions that you would have to answer, and you would also be interrogated about this as well. So the questions could be, are you married? Uh, do you have a job here in the United States? You were not supposed to have a job uh, waiting for you yet. So the immigrants had to be really careful about that, answering that question. Did they have any family? Uh, if they had any money? If they had been convicted of a felony? If they were an anarchist? All those kind of things. There was only a few things that you would be returned home for. So only about 2% of these people were denied entry. However, Angel Island is a little bit different. Angel Island on the west coast here up in the San Francisco Bay, predominantly Chinese immigrants between Chinese and Japanese uh, 1910 to 1940. This is a terrible environment. The questioning is much different than it was at Ellis Island. And not to mention, keep in mind, there is a language barrier going on there. And it is not a five-hour process. Some of these uh, immigrants in Angel Island could be housed from four to six weeks in barracks there at Angel Island before they were allowed entry. Now, the registry hall. This is the area where the immigrants would take their questionnaire and wait in line, and wait in line to meet an agent. And a lot of these people, as they are coming into the United States, they would end up changing their names and make it sound more American. After they would meet with the agent, 
and go over their interrogation of their questionnaire, they would be sent upstairs to the medical examination area. And what we're looking for here is able-bodied immigrants. We don't want people with any mental or physical illnesses, again, pox, tuberculosis, or measles. And we're not looking for someone with disabilities. If they have a bum leg or they're limping, more than likely they would be denied entry. We're looking for able-bodied men to work here. And the reason that it was on the second floor, it's really easy to tell if someone has a limp or there's something wrong with them to getting up the stairs. Uh, think about if you've ever seen anyone on campus with a, with a broken leg trying to crawl upstairs. It takes a little bit of time. And this medical exam was about 45 minutes, so almost about a third of the time that they're spending at Ellis Island is going to be in this medical examination. Here's a, a grainy picture, but you can see these guys are lifting up their shirt and showing the inspectors if, to see if there's anything wrong with them physically that they can see. This picture is not really great either, but the agent there on the right is lifting up the eyelid of this man. He's looking for conjunctivitis, and that's the fancy name for pink eye. Here's another much better picture of the agent looking at this underneath this woman's eyelid here, and again, for pink eye, and pink eye is highly, highly contagious, and we do not want any outbreaks of pink eye at Ellis Island. So if you had any sort of contagious disease, you would either be quarantined or you'd be sent back home. And what do you do once you get through Ellis Island? You now are able to take the little ferry across to New York City. You can see in the center there the Statue of Liberty. And most immigrants, if they could, they would end up taking a train to some other city. But for the most part, these immigrants did not have enough money to buy train tickets to go to any other part of the United States. And that's one of the main reasons why New York City grows to be the size that it is. So let's recap. You should be able to identify the factors that pushed and pulled immigrants to the United States, distinguish between old and new immigrants, and describe the treatment of immigrants at the processing stations. So if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.